Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a wonderful show for you this evening. Jason Shepard of M0A is here. It's going to be an incredibly educational evening, and I am just thrilled that he's able to join us. It's going to be a ton of fun. Before we get started, just a few things. First of all, Social Flight's Fly to Win Challenge is in full swing and nearing the end of our current prize period. We are giving away a Lightspeed Zulu 3 headset on October 1st. And all you need to do is get the free Social Flight mobile app for Apple or Android devices and just check in at at least one airport, even your local airport, and you'll be entered in to win. Check in at multiple airports where you fly, get on our leaderboard, you get extra entries into that drawing. Last time we gave away an Aspen E5 electronic flight instrument. We've got this light speed going on now, and after that we just keep rolling and rolling with more prizes. So be sure to get Social Flight and go check it out. And even if you don't play the Fly to Win Challenge, Social Flight is just filled with ton, just over 10,000 destinations and, and great places to fly, events both online and in person. Our mission is to get you out there and flying, and all you need to do is go to socialflight.com, see what's out there, and uh, get out there and fly. It's all about supporting general aviation, and we appreciate every single one of you and what you do to help make that possible. Now, tonight's guest, Jason Shepard, is a pilot, a flight instructor, author, and the founder of M0A.com, a leader in online pilot education. Jason's innovative approach to understanding aviation topics, as opposed to route memorization, has helped over 100,000 students around the world truly comprehend the aviation topics that can be confusing to even the best of us. Jason was named AOPA's top collegiate flight instructor in 2008, outstanding flight instructor in 2014 and 15. He's amassed over 9,000 hours of in-flight instruction. I am absolutely thrilled to have him with us tonight to talk about his philosophy of aviation mastery and hopefully leave us all better pilots after this evening. Please help me welcome to Social Flight Live as I bring him on the line right now, Jason Shepard. How are you doing, Jason? Hey, I am amazing, Jeff. So uh, just thankful uh, to be here. Great to see you again. We're making this like an annual uh, ritual now. I like it a little bit. So uh, great to see you, and thank you so much for the great uh, introduction. You're very, very welcome. Uh, you know, you're always welcome here on Social Flight, and uh, we appreciate everything that you do for aviation. So I like, I like the tradition of seeing you at those events, uh, as we just yes. saw you at uh, out there at Oshkosh at Air Venture. And uh, and also hosting you here on the show. <laughs> yes, so, yeah, I got like, to meet your your boys and everything else in Oshkar, so it was great. Thanks. So I'd like to get started by uh, tell us a little bit about how M0A got started and what your philosophy is, so we can understand the foundation as we get into tonight's discussion. Sure. Uh, M0A was founded really out of uh, a need. When I was studying for my written test, you know, we mistakenly call it an FAA written test. Um, the FAA actually calls it a knowledge test. Yet back in the olden days, Jeff, when I was learning to fly, there was nothing knowledge about it. Everything was, you know, rote memorization. It was, oh, when you see blue, the answer is B. And, and that is how we prepped for these, these written exams, as we called them. And I remember thinking, gosh, how I'm prepping for this thing is not making me a safer pilot, but everyone keeps telling me, uh, just, just buy this book and only highlight the correct answer, so that's all you see, and just, just get through the test, just get through it, just get to the check ride. I'm thinking, I am taking a hunk of metal through the sky at 90 knots. I don't know if memorizing answers is gonna help me when that propeller stops spinning, or whatever that may be, but my instructor told me to do it. My friends were telling me to do it. The owner of the flight school was telling me to do it. And I just remember thinking, you know, th there's got to be a better way to make truly safer, smarter pilots. You see it in the in the accident database. You can contribute. I would say about 98% of our 900 or so accidents that happen in general aviation every single year, you can always find a pilot factor in there. Very rarely does an airplane just magically fall out of the sky, an engine just happen to quit. Um, they don't tell you all the human elements that occur along that way of, hey, that the part that broke had an AD that's been overdue for two years, but 
the mechanic didn't look at it, the owner operator didn't look at it, you just see all these things. Um, we have to make informed pilots. And that's where we came up with this idea, not only of M0A, but this idea of pursuing what we're calling aviation mastery. You know, I really believe mastery is a quest, not a score on a test. I know that sounds catchy, but it's, it's true. You know, think about it this way. Um, I look at it really in three levels. We talk about, am I a current pilot? And what is, what is currency really, Jeff? Currency is, okay, I did my flight review, check. I did my three takeoffs and landings uh, within 90 days to carry passengers, check. I'm good to go, right? But if you went up to your passenger, Jeff, and said, hey, listen, you know, a year and a half ago, I did this thing, it's called a flight review, another one's coming up doing six months. I did three landings within 90 days. Do you wanna go fly with me? That's like bragging to somebody, hey, I got a 70% on my knowledge test. I'm a, I'm a great pilot. No one wants to be current. Current, I think, is just getting by. Mm -hmm. um, so instead, we're all pursuing proficiency, right? I want to be a proficient pilot. Proficiency, I view as, would I put my, my wife and my kids in that airplane? That's what proficiency means to me. But in reality, I believe there's even a level beyond that, which is pursuing mastery. And mastery is kind of like that black belt do you do you ever is a black belt ever really a black belt no they they go on to teach they pursue a second degree black belt like no one goes into the dojo and earns their black belt and goes all right i'm done <laughs> i'm a black belt right it, it's this quest that you're you're always um you're always pursuing and i think when we can adopt that humble attitude um uh, of pers i don't know everything but i'm in the process of trying to learn as much as i can pursuing mastery uh, that's how we make safer, smarter pilots. And that's the premise really behind M0A. That makes a lot of sense. And, and you know, one of the things that I don't think get much attention is the connection between the content that is part of all of the written knowledge exams. Yes. Uh, and what, how that translates to the rest of your flying. There seems to be a disconnect between mm -hmm. Whatever you need to do, it's just it's just a let's just get it done. Let's just get that out of the way, and the rest of your flight training. Right. And do you find that mm -hmm. the the information that is that is covered in those knowledge exams is legitimately critical to being a good pilot and really understanding those it's, topics? I'll tell you this: it's not perfect, but it's getting better. So I don't know uh, if, if all your viewers know this, but the, the knowledge test literally in the past 60 days has undergone some really, really big changes. Uh, private pilot and commercial pilot, they've now added five questions to. However, there are five unconsequential questions. So if you sit down to take a private pilot written test, when you and I did it, Jeff, there were 60 questions. Mm -hmm. Well, now there's 65 questions. However, five of them don't count and they don't tell you which ones don't count anymore. Uh, they've also shortened it up by 30 minutes. Now, we always had enough time to take the test, but it's now 30 minutes shorter uh, to take those tests as well. Um, so the FAA is testing new questions. They drip them in there. They have no, you get them right, it doesn't matter. You get them wrong, it doesn't matter. But you don't know that it's a beta test question, essentially. Mm -hmm. So you could show up to your written test, Jeff, get some really off the wall question and go, I watched all Jason's videos. I have no clue what they're even talking about in this question and get a little flustered when that's just a beta test question because they want to see how people are doing. I share all that to say that the FAA is injecting new questions. They're taking questions out. They're trying to get better. Is it as real world and scenario based as it could be? No, it's not. But remember the real premise behind the knowledge test is everyone test just like we learn differently we test differently too the knowledge test is meant to be a quiet sit down critical thinking abc type test whereas the check ride the oral portion of check ride is can i communicate my knowledge and put it in plain english and that's where students really struggle learners really struggle is i have the knowledge in my brain can i get it out my brain in english and communicate it to the examiner or now called an evaluator to the point where they know that I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, and then obviously the flying portion of that. So really divide aviation testing up into those three parts. A quiet little knowledge test, an oral examination from my brain out my mouth, and then can I fly the airplane?
That's what it really comes down to. And th those are three very different ways to prepare um, for that. And, and what we found is really the best way to prepare for those three very different things is real world preparation. Don't just go in and try to do rote memorization. Um, you know, one thing we always encourage is if you came to me, Jeff, and said, you know, it's my, it's my dream. Um, you know, I've got friends in, in, I don't know, Tennessee that I want to go visit. Well, you better believe we're going to do one of our cross countries to, to, you know, Memphis to go visit your friends one day to, to practice that cross country to get this real world scenario based training in there for these learners. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, have when we think about kind of dated portions of the exam and whether it's really evolved, are you finding that the FA is updating things? So, for instance, not all the images are about six packs and understanding situational or positional awareness yeah. based on that, but instead giving you some examples of what an integrated a glass panel would, might look like or an EFIS might look like or things like that. Do you see any any? We're not focusing on ADFs. Are, uh, it, is it's, any of this evolving? evolving? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Uh, you know, I'm not an FAA spokesperson or anything like that. Um, four years ago, we just removed microwave landing systems from the instrument knowledge test. I'm like, <laughs> I've never shot a microwave landing system approach in my life, but you were quizzed on it. Just like you said, ADFs and NDBs, you were quizzed on them. You probably never shot one in your life before. And unfortunately, the only questions that really apply about a glass panel are questions like, you know, one advantage of a glass panel is, and the answer is increases situational awareness. Duh. You know, right. that's a freebie. You're thankful for a freebie on that test. But at the end of the day, are we really learning anything from that? Um, I'm, I'm hoping for the days where they show me a glass panel with some failures and ask me, what is that failure that I would actually see? Um, but then again, you have to realize not everyone's flying on a glass panel. Uh, it's the same reason, um, if you recall, Jeff, back when you and I learned to fly, there were questions on how to do a, a taxi in a crosswind in a tailwheel aircraft. Well, I didn't mm -hmm. fly a tailwheel aircraft, and if you don't know, it's actually opposite how you would turn and, and position the ailerons in a tailwheel as opposed to a tricycle gear aircraft. So they, they have this history of quizzing us on things that, may not even apply to us at that season. But they're trying to kind of get a broad brush uh, of everybody there. So there's still going to be six pack stuff. They're dripping in G1000 stuff. They did get rid of the tail dragger questions, thankfully. Um, but that's just, that's the state of it right now. And, it, and it's, this is why, and I know I have a strong bias, but this is why something like an online ground school um, is so powerful. Uh, mm -hmm. To know your blind spots, to know where you're weak, um, in your knowledge and know those areas you can really drill down to and focus in on. That makes a lot of sense. I, I mean, there is something to be said, of course, to a lot of those technologies that are still there because your backup is not necessarily going to be electronic, for example. Um, I did an article in AOPA recently about, you know, the fact that GP, if you really look at all the GPS outages that are out there, yeah. they're much more prevalent and significant than people give them credit for. And yes. so the understanding, if you are an IFR pilot especially, of, how, of making sure you are current on how to fly radio navigation uh, in the aircraft, how to handle things like that, mm -hmm. or even the existence of something like a radar assisted approach and getting mm -hmm. that to even know it exists seems to yes. be really beneficial. Yes. No, you're, you're exactly right. I remember I was flying back um, many years ago. I bought an airplane in Utah, was flying back to the southerly route, um, and there was a notum that the military was testing its GPS jamming technology, just like what you're alluding to. And you would be amazed. We're somewhere, I don't know, middle of nowhere, Arizona, New Mexico, I can't recall where. They're testing this, and you would have been amazed at the airline pilots who are calling up to center and, and complaining about, what do you mean I have to use a VOR? Well, I don't remember how to use my VOR. I think like, I can be a little old school sometimes. Like I like having a skill set to fall back on. I love technology. We, we just did a whole uh, new course on flying with ForeFlight, flying with Garmin Pilot, flying with, uh, with iFly EFB, all, all these different great EFBs um, we mentioned in there. And um, I can embrace technology, but at the same time, I like you to have a skill set to fall back on. I still make, in our online ground school, I still make our members learn how to fill out a classic traditional nav log for their cross countries. 
And many, many students are spoiled just showing up and going into their iPad and programming direct enter enter and going here, Mr. Evaluator, Miss, Miss Evaluator, there's my cross country flight plan for my tripod check ride. Like, eh, you know, that's, you may get away with it, you may not um, as well. So I still make people plan out a traditional cross country nav log because I believe it's a skill set is going to serve you um, when you're making these long cross countries and you're watching fuel burn and the winds are changing and ground speeds changing you know the levers that to pull to, to change those numbers to make them more favorable or less favorable or what's making them less favorable as well I think that's important right and and again if you look at things like safety as you talked about in the beginning and you look at what causes accidents in many cases mm -hmm. they are non-critical uh, failures in the aircraft or other changing conditions that happen that throw the pilot off their game to the point that they take a situation that shouldn't take the aircraft down and and actually do that. It could be an electrical system failure, something like that. The aircraft, keep, the engine keeps going, the aircraft is able to handle it, but if the pilot panics and doesn't know how to do pilotage or doesn't know how to figure out things, or uh, then yeah. you can really have some serious problems. I, I read an NTSB report just uh, we every every Tuesday like this. I do a webinar with our online ground school members, and uh, I was preparing an NTSB report to share on this exact topic of of pilots not knowing the airplane, not not troubleshooting appropriately. Pilot was coming out of uh, coming from altitude, mixture leaned out for 8,500 feet, coming down to land, never adjusted the mixture back to rich per the checklist. Come into land was a little bit high, a little bit fast. When to initiate a go around, now down at sea level, mixture still leaned for up at 8,500 feet, gave it full power, and in his words, the engine quit. Well, of course the engine quit, right? You got the mixture leaned all the way out, you're asking it for more power, it doesn't have it. Um, and he had a little off airport excursion, and the NTSB showed up and said this, it was the mixture. And, and you just think, and sometimes as pilots, we, we freeze, we forget to run our checklists. We forget, I mean, how many gear up landings do we have? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, of, of, of pilot induced ones, right? I'm not talking, they just didn't come down. I'm talking right. pilot induced, pilot totally forgot. Um, and it takes a lot of humility for pilots to, to share that, but they happen. Um, we're only human and we make mistakes. So how do we take that, you know, we're not anywhere close to taking the human element out of it. They haven't even perfected self-driving cars yet. If anybody's watching this, think of an aviation career. Your aviation career is safe. Maybe for your kids it might be a problem, but your aviation career is safe because we can't even figure out self-driving cars just yet. Um, we still need plenty of pilots. But um, with that human element in there, uh, we're prone to make mistakes. Am I tired? Am I hungry? Am I, am I whatever? And we just... It's not like in a car where I make a mistake or I get lost and I can pull over and call AAA. You know, we don't get second chances in aviation. And this is why I just take this idea of mastery so seriously because it could just be one little mistake. Um, you know, the other day, I, the other day, two days ago, I had an alternator failure um, in a Cirrus. And again, just work the checklist and everything ended up being just fine. But that's a situation where you panic and you freak out especially in a series that's so dependent on everything electrical, um, that could cause some serious issues for you. So these are the things you have to um, really prep for and study for is the unknown, right? And I don't think everybody knows how to do that. And that's why we try to show them at M0A. Right. So talk to me a little bit about your philosophy and, and what it is that about the videos that M0A produces and the content that you produce that, uh, that achieves this goal, that, that pushes towards aviation mastery and helps people understand all of this? Because obviously there have been a, a lot of, uh, of very well-known people that have come before you, and yet your content has been of such quality that it's driven this, this wonderfully large uh, audience to be extremely successful. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I personally believe, and I'm sure there's there's members out there watching. Maybe they can they can chime in as well what they believe. But um, ask the question. I, I believe it's teaching the why behind the maneuver. Um, I never learned why we did slow flight. I hated slow flight as a private pilot because I hated stalls. I had a fear of stalls. So slow flight to me was just getting really close to a stall, and I had absolutely no clue why we were doing it. And you're pitched so far back like this, and I can't see anything. And I, I just, 
I couldn't process why we did slow play. And then one day a very wise instructor came to me and said, well, Jason, we practice slow flight so you can get better at your landings. I said, what, what do you mean I practice slow flight so I can get better at my land? I'm at 3,500 feet. How am I getting better at landings? And he explained to me, he said, well, think about it. Right when you're in ground effect, right before you touch down, you're in slow flight. Now you're only in there for two or three seconds. And that's why we have to practice it up here because the ailerons are so sloppy. If you take the controls, you can move them like this and the wings barely move. The rudder is so sensitive though. The power settings are so subtle, but so powerful, but with a little bit of power in, a little bit of power out. So we practice doing slow flight up here for minutes because when you're in ground effect, you're only in slow flight for three or four seconds until you you know, find the ground, hopefully in a smooth manner. I said, wow, I'm practicing slow flight to, to get better at my landings. Um, the same happened with my stalls. I had a fear of stalling because I felt like I always had to set it up just right. I had to get the scenario. I had to get that, you know, that nose up like this and just hanging by the prop like in my helicopter. And that same wise instructor said, no, Jason, we practice stalls so we could practice recoveries. I don't care how you stall the airplane, right? People stall the airplane all sorts of different configurations. They do accelerated stalls. They pitch up power on. They do it power. We can stall that airplane eight different ways, right? And I'm exaggerating a little bit, but there's many ways to stall an airplane. He goes, it's all about how you recover, how, how you first off recognize the stall is coming um, and how you initiate a recovery before recovery is even necessary. So, wow, I always thought a stall was just all about, you know, scaring me like I'm on a roller coaster because that's how it was treated. So when you can, and I can go on and on about commercial maneuvers and everything else, but when you start to understand the why, why am I doing this? What, what is the benefit to me for doing this maneuver? things change uh, for our students. Um, take that same slow flight example, and what we encourage our online grounds members to do is with their instructor, go do slow flight down the runway, right? So now combine both things. Go get in ground effect, and I want you a foot off the runway, and don't touch the runway, just hold it there and practice slow flight down the runway. And you'd be amazed at how landings just change for people. Um, when they understand the why behind it and can apply it um, in the in the airplane itself. That makes a lot of sense. And you apply that to all the different phases uh, of flight or different types of flying that, that you do. So, I mean, you mentioned commercial, right? One of the big criticisms of commercial maneuvers is why am I having to do chandelles and lazy eights and these and turns around a point because I'm never going to do this as, a, a, as an airline pilot. Right. What, what's your answer to that? Wow, chandelles especially. I mean, think about a chandelle as, okay, the real extreme example, I fly into a box canyon and I need to get out. Uh, there, was a, there was a very sad accident of an Icon A5 in California that exact thing happened to. Um, think about it as I'm approaching nasty weather here or a mountain, whatever it is, I need to get up and out of that situation. Um, why do I practice lazy eights? Did you know the reason it's called a lazy eight? The lazy part is because you, the pilot, shouldn't be doing much. The actual thing, and if I get to through my Zulu and show you, the actual thing with the lazy eight is I'm supposed to set the airplane in that pitch attitude and in that bank angle and let it do its job. And actually, when I get to the top of that arc, it should be done flying, and that nose should want to come down naturally. If I set my pitch and my power and my bank settings appropriately, it's all about knowing your airplane, the airplane should fly it for you. And that's the big thing that you're teaching there is if you find yourself like white knuckling this thing and trying to break the yoke off in your hand, well, we have a problem because this airplane wants to keep flying and it's your job as the pilot just to set it to where it's going and, and work on it um, from there. That's why it's a lazy eight. You're not supposed to do a whole lot. If you find yourself in a death grip during a lazy eight, you're doing it wrong. A lazy eight can be done with two fingers on the yoke. Just set it and let it go through uh, the motions that it wants to go through. I love that. It, and, and a lot of it, it, when you understand the reason behind it, you understand what you're trying to accomplish, then of course, as you said, you can get proficient at it. And one of the things that that's a big kind of almost mission of pilot, you know, mission of mine, even though I'm not a flight instructor, is about people understanding their aircraft and understanding the yes. envelope of that aircraft. I, you know, my first aircraft was a Grumman uh, Traveler and 
for quite a few years when I first owned it, I flew it one way until I got to a convention and went up with a flight instructor really familiar with the plane. And they said, um, let me show you what it can do. And it wasn't something crazy. It was like, here's how we can slip it in. He literally turned to me and said, do you think that you, we can safely get down right now? We were very high um, and right down, touch down on the numbers. And I was like, yeah, I couldn't. And he's like, it's yes, you could. Let me show you something. And he showed how wow. slow you can be in that case, how that you can, you know, kind of own the aircraft, let the aircraft work for you. Yes. You're not doing anything crazy. You are just actually understanding the flight envelope in a way that yes. I think a lot of people don't. Tell me your thoughts on that. Well, and, and it's a beautiful concept. And take it even further. How many people are practicing short field takeoffs and short field landings? But if I ask them, well, could you land at that runway? I bet the answer would be no or I don't know, perhaps. Mm. Um, one thing we always encourage our ground school members to do, you can go on a service like Google Earth and say, okay, from, from the end of 3.6 to taxiway alpha 2 is about 1,500 feet. I'm going to go out there and see if I can get airborne before alpha 2. Okay, great. I actually I was up about halfway. I was up about 750 feet. So then you start to learn, okay, it was just me on the plane. I had full fuel, but it was August. So it was awfully hot in the afternoon. I can do 750 feet. Okay, now same runway, but now I've got four people on board, still in August, max gross weight. I need it all the way to Alpha 2. I used the entire 1,500 feet. But now I know what my airplane is capable of. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to go in and out. I'm not trying to be a bush pilot. You know, I have a whole new respect for how to fly in and out of Alaska and missions and, and all that sort of stuff. But I believe you have a duty to know what your airplane is truly capable of. Uh, you're missing out on some great airports because you don't think your airplane can make it in there. You can make it out of there. And, and you could be right, certainly, but you could be very wrong um, as well. You've got to know your airplane. Uh, and, and you can figure this out with an instructor if you're not comfortable. But like you're saying, Jeff, um, working your airplane through its paces. Uh, mm -hmm. You'd be amazed, Jeff, the people who've never done a slip to landing. Um, they've practiced a forward slip, but to actually do it, to come all the way down to a landing is, is unheard of. Um, many instructors don't even like teaching them because you're technically cross-controlled, but they don't realize that if you just keep that nose forward, that airplane's gonna keep flying. That comes all back to knowing the stall characteristics, knowing the stall warning signs, all these things of truly understanding your aircraft. And that's easier said than done, because I know there's people watching this that go, this sounds great, Jason and Jeff, but I fly to flight school, I fly a different airplane every time. Well, it's, it's true that not every 172 is exactly the same, uh, but you still need to learn it to the best of your ability, and eventually you're going to be in a flying club or in a flying career where you're going to have, that's the make and model of airplane I fly, and you know it kind of forwards and backwards. Yeah, and well, you're really you're really speaking to me on this, and and the way that I like to approach it. And it doesn't really matter if you're renting an aircraft or if you own an aircraft. Uh, it, it gets more serious, I think, or, or or a larger missed opportunity perhaps for people who own an aircraft and fly the same one constantly. But even if you're renting, and it could be any one of a number of 172s, it doesn't matter that much. It's still the idea of how do we get people to explore that envelope that is all safe it's all been certified yes oh yeah get there and say to yourself i actually want to get a bunch of people get whatever number of people to go with me uh today because i've got a long runway uh and i want to know what it's like to fly near gross or i want to know what it's like to fly with an aft cg or with a forward cg again all within the envelope or on a hot day or on a humid day too many people, uh, I think, either stay at the very, very center of the envelope, and they feel like that's their safe zone. And mm -hmm. then something in life is going to challenge that and push them yeah. out of that zone. And now, to their to their capabilities, they're a test pilot because they've right. never yeah. actually done very that. Very well said. Well, and and think of it this way too. And this is something the audience can, most of the audience can relate to. Think of your first solo. You were used to flying with your instructor at their 150 pounds, let's say 200 pounds, whatever that may be, and you've done all your landings, all your slow flight, everything with that instructor. 
that 150 pound instructor gets out of that airplane and I guarantee your first solo, you thought you were in a rocket ship. That thing took off, it climbed, you floated, your landings were a little poor because of that float and you were not ready for that. You're within your envelope, but it's a very different side of your airplane you were seeing. Um, I had a very similar situation. My instructor, uh, her name was Mary. She was 100 pounds, very, very little lady. So we did everything. Again, airplane still performed like a rocket, even with her out of it. For the day of my check ride, my check ride examiner was a big, strong, we'll call him 200 pounds to, to be respectful there. It was probably a little bit more. But here I am, used to doing slow flight, stalls, power off landings, everything with little Mary at 100 pounds. Now I'm basically adding 100, 150 pounds to this airplane, and I almost came up short my first short field landing because I was used to the glide characteristics with 100 to 150 less pounds in that airplane. And it doesn't sound like a lot, but it all really adds up. So to your point, how do we, let's invite some friends. Let's, um, you're, if not, this is gonna sneak up on you. Someone's gonna ask you to do a Young Eagles ride or take someone on their unofficial first discovery flight. Um, not too terribly long ago, I was doing a discovery flight and um, it was a really, it was a young kid and the dad insisted that he wanted to go on the discovery flight and I'm all about it. But the dad was a, again, really, really big, strong boy and his son was like eight years old and couldn't have weighed but 70 pounds. And in my mind, I'm doing the weight and balance going, I can't have this 70-pound kid up front and a 250-pound dad in the back seat of the 172. That's really going to throw off my center of gravity. So because I knew the envelope of the aircraft, I, again, I got to have the awkward conversation of, hey, we take your son flying, then if you really want to go flying, we'll leave your son on the ground, and then I'll take you flying. But I can't have you in the back seat. And I showed it to him on, you know, on the EFB and on the iPad, showed him how adding you, how it, we're, we're in the envelope, but we're way, way at the back side of this. And to be smart, I'd rather be here in the envelope and use it as a teaching opportunity uh, mm -hmm. is what it really comes down to with all of that. But you, you've got to know your airplane uh, from a weight and balance standpoint, from a performance standpoint, from an endurance standpoint, right? How many people go, yeah, my airplane holds four and a half hours of fuel. Well, I guarantee you've never tested that theory. I don't ever want to test that theory. Let's let's. That's one of those performance areas, Jeff. I think we both agree. You round down on that one. Okay, I hold four and a half hours of fuel. We'll call it. We'll call it three hours, and I'll 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 only fly three hour legs, kind of thing. Exactly. Exactly. And that at least that's one that that if you're just going to stack it in your favor, then it's the worst case scenario of weather or something else that you know you've padded it uh, in in your favor, but. If it's something about performance, getting off a runway or being able to make a short one way, or if, if it's something about the CG loading, again, maybe you're not used to doing it. I remember only probably only five, six years ago, I got my own lesson in the impact of humidity as opposed to just temperature. When I took off uh, uh, at a high gross weight and all the charts looked fine, but I, I learned like, wow, that was a remarkable difference with very yes. high humidity to something that I've done before, even at the same temperature. And I was, I was shocked, but it gave me the knowledge, having done it in that safe environment, to say, now I know, if I'm looking at a short field, what a difference something like yes. this is going to make. You're, you are exactly right. And people... Um, to go into, it's kind of a controversial topic, but everyone always loves talking about the impossible turn. And um, people, I do a video on it every year and people always want to debate, oh, it, I can do it. I, I only need 400 feet, I can do it. And you know what, they may be right. Um, you may only need 400 feet in your Cessna 150 with half tanks with just you on board in Michigan in December. That, that, that might actually work. However, now put that same Cessna 150 at maximum gross weight, keep it in Michigan in August. Um, that 400 feet is gonna put you maybe on a left crosswind, you're not gonna make it. So it's one thing to know my performance numbers, but I have to, as the pilot, always be dialing in, okay, what are the three factors that affect NCL2? What is happening with this, with weight? All of these different factors, and like you said, you've gotta add the padding to the plus and minus side of this um, to truly know your numbers. Like you were surprised about humidity. Um, anytime I fly out west, I'm always surprised about elevation how I'm rolling down the runway, and I, I normally used to say an airspeed alive, and I'm looking over there going, my air, I'm moving, but my airspeed's not alive just yet because the air is so thin out there. Yeah. Um, 
these are just different things you don't always get to experience, especially as a Florida-based pilot. So we're really talking a lot about mindset, I think, uh, and that that's mm -hmm. an interesting thing to understand how you how you teach to, because it seems that there is a there's a mindset of kind of staying near home base, staying near home base with where you fly, the airports you fly into, the way you fly, the way you operate the aircraft, and then there's a different mindset. Uh, two pilots, let's say an IFR pilot, one type of IFR pilot looks at a, a great day with low, with relatively low ceilings and says, I'm going to go fly today. Why? Because right. this is the perfect day to go up and get some currency and shoot some approaches. Yes. Another one says, I got the ticket so that I can do it when I need to, not right. go out and voluntarily do these things. Uh, tell right. me your thoughts on those mindsets and how, how we change them, I guess. Yeah, I am. Um, we have to avoid complacency to really answer the first part of the person that is just comfortable. They live in their little bubble. They fly to their three or four airports. They go to their meetings. I would argue that pilot is more dangerous than the pilot who says, hey, it's, you know, 700 foot overcast stratus layer today. I'm gonna go shoot some approaches. Um, the complacent pilot is the, is the dangerous one. And, and I've been that pilot, and I guarantee there's people on this webinar right now that have been that pilot as well, where complacency um, sneaks in. There's no room for that. Um, you get complacent flying the same routes, the same airplane, talking the same controllers on the same frequencies, and then one day they give you a different frequency, and you're your whole life is just turned upside down. You're like, what do you mean it's not 118.6 today? Or you go to 118.6 because it's a it's an expectation bias is what it's called. You're expecting the frequency to change to this, and it's not. Um, that's dangerous. Um, yeah. I love the pilot who is willing to, hey, it's 700 foot overcast. I'm going to call my instructor, and let's see if we can go shoot some approaches because that's a great day to do it. Um, I'm never a fan of the instrument student, the instrument learner who does their entire instrument rating, never sticking their head in the, in the clouds. Right. Because awesome. you and I know this so well that there's such a difference between the foggles or the hood and really being in the clouds. It, it's, it, I mean, it's not even close, um, as you know, and I struggle with that. I think people do all their training in a, in a beautiful state like Florida or Arizona where they can get away with never sticking their head in the clouds. Um, and then one day it's nasty and they go, well, I'm instrument rated, so I'm going to do it. That's just as dangerous too. Thinking I have a ticket, so I'm just going to just do it. You've got to work your way into that sort of stuff as well. So there's, there's really a balance to the approach that you're taking. And the solution is, and I know it sounds just like a catchy marketing slogan we use in every video. We always say a good pilot is always learning. And, mm -hmm. and that's important for a few reasons. I use the word good and not great because as pilots, we have to have a certain level of humility, right? I'm a good pilot. I'm not a great pilot. I'm an aspiring great pilot, but I'm just good. And, and being just good reminds you that, hey, I, I am not, you know, immortal, right? I, I need to take this thing slow. I need a pre-flight. I need to avoid complacency. I need to bring the right people along with me, instructors, talent, whatever that may be, um, in all things. And I'm always learning. I'm always in the pursuit of, of, of more. I was, I was actually looking at my 2024 conference schedule and I'm attending more conferences as an attendee to sit back and learn than I am exhibiting as M0A. And I, I think, you know, that's the kind of approach you have to take is what can I be learning? Uh, mm -hmm. what, can, what can I be doing? How can I be expanding into tailwheel, the seaplane, glider, whatever it may be? Um, a good pilot is always learning, and it's just it's something you have to live by. Yeah, I think that there we we seem to have disconnected and and kind of view as mutually exclusive the idea of adventure and safety. That those mm. things are somehow opposed or don't overlap really well. And it seems that if you kind of embrace adventure in your flying, embrace the idea that what are you going to do today? Well. I'm going to go, go, I'm going to go into a, a, you know, a grass strip because I haven't flown in a grass yes. strip in a long time. I'm going to go to this place I've never gone before, or I'm going to go and actually do a time to climb with my aircraft and see what I really get out of or experiment yeah. with some things. Or like, I, like we said before, load some people up, see what the performance is or get out there and do something I haven't. Even if you want the 
or, you, or need the safety or security of bringing on, along an instructor or more experienced pilot that um, you're always saying, I want, this, I want this adventure, I want this thing in here. That's building that knowledge base uh, to make you safer. Yeah. Yeah, well, and that's that's one thing social flight does so well is getting the <laughs> airports to get out there to go to, and that's not a, that's not a, a plug or trying to suck up to you by any means, but that we see that so often. I'm a private pilot. Now what? Like, where do I go? What do I do? Okay, I can get how many hundred dollar hamburgers can I get? Like, you have to get out of your airport environment. There's a reason I fly to Oshkosh every year in a 172. I think it's fun. I think it's an adventure. I think it's new airports. We land at Class Bravos and we land at uncharted little grass strips that we get invited to and, and everything really in between. It's an adventure. It's totally safe. I mean, this year alone, we were delayed for weather two days in Nashville and we were just kind of stuck there. And but that's general aviation. And that's a part of the, being stuck in a city. It's just part of the adventure sometimes. And you've got to budget the time for that. Um, you know, I think it's dangerous when you have these non-refundable hotels and everything else, we literally, we have an idea of where we're gonna go on the way to Oshkosh. Um, our goal is to make it to Nashville tonight. If we make it there, great. If we don't, it doesn't matter. I don't even book a hotel in advance or a rental car in advance. We land, we hop on an app like Hotel Tonight, wherever we end up, we get a hotel, we get an Uber, and we're good. I think that, that's a great way to do the adventure. I don't even know where I'm gonna to sleep tonight, but we're gonna to figure it out because People add a lot of pressure when you book the Marriott in Nashville and you go, well, they're not going to refund it now. It's within 24 hours. So I've got to be there. And now you, you cross the, you forget adventure and you're just crossing the safety line because you're pushing it and whether you shouldn't or pushing it in fuel conditions that you shouldn't because Marriott's going to charge you 140 bucks that night. You're not going to get your money back. Like that's ridiculous to think about. Um, so there's, there's parameters you can put in place to have that adventure, have that fun, um, and keep safety at the forefront. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And, I, and one of the reasons I have a big grin on my face, you, you may not be familiar uh, with it, but we did a video series uh, last uh, summer uh, called No Magenta Line, where we actually went wow. on a trip with no destination at any step. And there was never a magenta line on the navigator. We just so literally good. went up there and would go in a compass direction, use the map to make sure that we didn't go into airspace or do something else. But then we just look at towns and cities and sit there and go, that looks like a good airport. Look it up and let's go land. And each time <laughs> that we landed there, that was where we stayed the night, no plan. And it turned into yeah. some of the best, most amazing adventures uh, we ever had. So I certainly love that concept. Yeah, and it doesn't have to just be Oshkosh. It could be an adventure, like you said. There are so many fun little fly-ins uh, coming up. There's, I saw there's a Mooney gathering in Tampa coming up. I'm thinking, I'm not even a Mooney guy, but that'd be cool to go check out. Just be around a bunch of pilots and hang out and learn and just talk aviation, hangar talk and everything else. There's so many neat things that we can be doing in aviation if we get out there and get active. we got to participate. We can't sit back and be a wallflower. We have to get out there and participate. So let's talk about some educational topics with uh, with some time that we have here. Um, let's talk about weather, because that's something mm -hmm. as we as we approach fall, a lot of different things happening around the country, whether it be uh, hurricane season in the East Coast and, yeah. Uh, yeah. Or, or, or just general general fronts. Tell me a little bit about your educational content regarding weather mm -hmm. and how we can do a better job educating pilots about it because I feel like we've gotten great technology in terms of ADSB, in terms of you know XM weather, things like that. But it almost feels like we have started to lose our understanding mm -hmm. of what makes it happen. Yeah, uh, well said. So um, I'm sure people watching this perhaps saw I did a live stream uh, when Hurricane Idalia was working its way up up Florida and ended up impacting uh, the Panhandle, uh, Cedar Key type, Steenhatchee type area. And it was literally just off the coast. I was down in Naples at the time, it was just off the coast of Naples. And I'm on, on the iPad kind of showing this. And this was totally un, un, unscripted. We were planning a fictitious flight from I think Naples to Ocala and just we're gonna make a go or no go decision. Obviously it's a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico. Pretty obvious what the decision should be. But I showed everybody, we looked at just the METARs and we looked at every METAR from Naples 
to Ocala. And we looked at it on that beautiful little METAR map and it was green circle, green circle, green. Everything was green. Yet we all knew there was a hurricane just 30 miles off the coast and it was coming. Yet if you just looked at the METARs, which is a snapshot in time, and even worse, if you just look at, oh, it's green dots, green means go, right? Um, you would look at that and you could have made a really dumb decision and been flying in a hurricane. I share all that to say that you cannot just look at, at one weather store. You can't just look at METARs, just like you can't just look at TAFs. You have to look at so many different weather sources and, and data points to really make an informed decision and get that complete picture. I tell the story often, JFK Jr. We don't know this for a fact, but he was the only person flying that day. Someone went over to one of those old uh, uh, WSI weather computers and got uh, pulled a METAR for Essex County, New Jersey, and a METAR for Martha's Vineyard, and that's it. And we just assume it was him because there was no login or anything like that, and no one else was flying that day. Again, if you just grab a snapshot of where I'm at and where I'm going, and don't look at anything in between, you've got a skewed view uh, of what's happening. Um, these are the types of things we try to teach. Um, think of it this way. Um, if I'm flying on a long cross country, and every time I check in with ATC, I check in uh, 2 3 Mike Zulu, Jackson Altimeter, 2 9 9 2 Okay, that's great. Next controller, 2 3 Mike Zulu, Jackson Altimeter, 2 9 8 8 You go, oh, okay, went down a little bit. And then it's 2 9 8 5 And on my fourth controller now, and the altimeter setting, which is pressure, right? just keeps going down. And I'm looking at the clouds and they're kind of getting worse. And I remember that Jason guy told me in a video that low pressure is all the ingredients and it's typically bad weather. A hurricane after all is a low pressure system. So if I'm flying along and the pressure's going down, there's a high probability that if I'm looking at weather and I'm lying to myself going, it'll probably get better. Yet the pressure is going down, I'm doing exactly that. I'm just lying to myself that weather's not gonna get any better. Mm -hmm. The same is true of, of the pilot who's flying at 7 p.m. in the summertime and the temperature dew point spreads like two degrees apart and you're pushing it along and you don't realize that, hey, when that temperature dew point gets close, there's moisture in the air in the summertime, you're going to have fog on landing. You might want to land now rather than pushing it another 30 minutes as that temperature keeps dropping. Yes, it says clear now on the METAR. It's not going to say that in 30 minutes as that temperature gets closer to that dew point. These are the things like that's not going to be just in a METAR. Hey, fog is coming here soon. You as the pilot have to know the ingredients for these things. Mm -hmm. Low pressure, typically bad weather, close temperature, dew point spread, all these different things you have to know and understand because if not, you'll find yourself stuck in a, in a crummy situation. You have to know weather at such a deep level and know the ingredients that are going to be causing that weather to make those informed decisions. That is so, so important. Uh, and I've known so many people that have gotten caught with that. I have gotten caught with it myself as well. Oh, yeah, me too. Where, especially since this isn't something that you usually get a lot of assistance from ATC on. Um, they are going to tell you static conditions. They're going to tell you things about uh, there's a cell at, at you know, at, your, at 11 o'clock for this distance, and we're seeing light to moderate precipitation, whatever. They're going to tell you things and say, but it's clear behind it. And I've been right. caught in that trap. And I think a lot of pilots look at the graphical presentations that they get in the cockpit and believe these are um, predictable by only looking at the graphics in front of them. Meaning yeah. I see these cells, I see the cells moving, and therefore I can sort of predict what's gonna happen and where I'm gonna be at this time, I should be absolutely fine. And I know where I have gotten caught many, many years ago was exactly similar to what you described. Instead of just fog, though, it was an area that they were saying, you're fine in this, like you're absolutely fine to come around this, then you should be fine. And literally the area just kind of condensed and went convective, not yes. in a pinpoint like we used, like we love to see on a, on a map, right. but instead in an area. And it, yes. and it, and it that that dynamic and knowing that can happen, it, it seems like that's the kind of thing we can get from your education. Well, and did you know that graphical radar, while it's beautiful, did you know a fast radar return is eight minutes? Meaning, mm -hmm. and that's fast. So 
So you could be looking at weather that's eight minutes or older, and that's what you're basing your decisions on. So you have to always keep that in mind that I'm never crazy when pilots or even controllers suggest that, hey, I've got a hole in the weather over here. Well, yeah, you might on your screen, but it may not be there when I get there. Um, so I'm not going to go through a hole in the weather that normally gets you in trouble. I, I kind of, anytime I find someone using the word hole, you know, related to weather, I, I'm going somewhere else. I don't, I don't need to find any holes in the weather. I fly a little 172. That hole's going to be gone by the time I get there. Trust me. Um, and, and there's other aspects too. I, I read an NTSB report um, of a pilot who his last phrase that he said to the FBO was, it's only green on the radar. And I think people make, they, people make that mistake sometimes because, and I've had it happen, I've been flying where it's green on the radar and I go, well, it's not even raining here. It must just be, you know, I mean, because all radar is is reflectivity of moisture. So there's moisture, it's just way up above me. It's no big deal. I can go through that, right? In your mind and you, you get away with it and you fly through green another time. It's not even misting. There's no issues here. And then there's a third time and that green becomes yellow, becomes red, becomes extreme precipitation you know, just like that. And yeah. but you got away with it a few times, right? That, that's right. the scary part about weather. Pilots get away with it and mm -hmm. it becomes normal to fly in crummy conditions. And then one day you don't get away with it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that, that's the scary part about, uh, about weather. It's, it's, is when you get away with flying through green or yellow and, yeah. and live to tell about it. And, and the thing that's also interesting is now in our aircraft, we have both XM and uh, uh, and, and uh, the ADSB weather, and you can see just between those two how radical the differences are. Big time. Uh, big, big, big time. differences. Big differences in color representations in what you see. And it's not just an accuracy thing. And and so I, I do appreciate the dynamics, and I'm excited to see the videos that you put together and the education that you have um, in that on that topic because I really think weather is obviously one of the biggest things that people have to learn to, to deal with. Yeah, big time. I mean, it's just, it's a valuable skill set. I, I tell all our ground school members, you know, I can make you the best stick and rudder pilot, right? Uh, an Earhart, a Rickenbacker, a Jaeger, whatever it is, whoever you aspire to be. But if you can't make good decisions, that skill set is all, all in vain. Knowledge isn't power, knowledge is potential power. So I can fill your brain with all this great nerdy aviation knowledge, but if you don't do something with it, it's, it's all in vain. That's how I really look at it. How do you educate people about that? Is a lot of it through things like your NTSB reviews that you just mentioned mm -hmm. that you do so that you, you help, because uh, you have knowledge that you impart, but then you're also trying to change mindset. Um, and, and tell me a little bit about what your content you provide for that. So like in the weather lesson, for example, it's really broken up into two things. We teach the ingredients that cause weather, the three ingredients of a thunderstorm, what causes fog, what causes, what needs to be present for icing. Just because the freezing level's there doesn't mean there's, there's got to be other ingredients for icing to happen. So we talk about uh, what the causation of weather and then, like you said, we dive into, I mean, I can't tell you how many dozens of NTSB reports we'll have. We have a great animation team. We'll go and animate them and everything else to really show them. And then we step back and say, okay, you're in this pilot's shoes. What, what should we have done? What, what went wrong? Where do we make the mistakes? So uh, the weather, the, the briefer said the weather was going to be this, but clearly it ended up being this. Like that's the kind of stuff we look at that, listen, even, even your iPad can be wrong. Even a weather briefer can be wrong. It's mother nature after all. And show people how a few layer becomes a scattered layer, becomes a broken layer, becomes an overcast layer, and you're stuck on top and you're VFR only, right? We just find these types of stories because I think as humans, we learn and we remember stories uh, that much better. That, that certainly makes a lot of sense. And I like the idea of taking a storied approach to it because it does seem that we have these two almost opposing things that have happened over time. On one hand, we have all we have all this technology, we have better weather forecasting and things like that available to us and even in the cockpit. On the other hand, unfortunately, I'm old enough to remember when flight service was local and yeah. used to be able to be your 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 hand and and really since they were local, I know uh, certainly it's probably true all around the country. But when it was local here in New England, they when you talk to them, they would say things like, 
this is what it is and this is what it's forecast to, but I really expect it to burn off around this time if it's fog. Right. Or I really expect it to roll in. Even though we're saying this, I'm telling you, I expect based on the temperature and the dew point and what we usually see around Nantucket, this is likely to happen. We don't get right. that coaching from a third party mm -hmm. anymore. And a lot of that really to synthesize that knowledge is put onto us as pilots now. Right. And there was something power, and this still occurs, but there's something powerful about hearing those words via far flight, not recommended. Like when they say that, you go, you know, they're, they're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm probably going to cancel today. Um, but we don't get that now. We just do everything on our iPad, and you're exactly right. It's our job to make that go or no go decision. And, and I appreciate that responsibility. And even when a, when a flight service station uh, briefer says VFR flight not recommended, it's still my decision. Um, but it feels a little foolish when they said don't go and you go, right? Um, right. Whereas on the iPad, I've seen people just justifying it. Well, I know it says, the METAR says this, but if you look at the tap, it says it's gonna get better. But then the radar says this, and by the way, it is a cold front passing through. Like people try to justify or they, they hang on to the one fact that they they hope comes true um and you can't do that you can't go into a weather brief with a bias if you have a flight that you have to be there or, or like it's a meeting and i've got to go collect this check in person or sign this contract you better have a backup plan with a rental car or an airline ticket or something because you never have to be anywhere in general aviation and i know there's people watching this now that say but I've canceled my check ride three times. They're so hard to get scheduled right now. You know what? I view that as every time you cancel or a check ride gets canceled, it's you making a smart decision. Because the first thing I would march into on that check ride is go, hey, I know this is really hard to schedule. And I apologize for canceling three times, but I just wasn't comfortable with the weather. And I want to make smart decisions. Like you're going to start your check ride off on the right foot. <laughs> I know it was a pain to book that all. But when you show like, hey, I'm willing to give up something that's really important to me to make a good decision. Uh, it goes a long way, but that can't just happen on the check ride. That's got to carry over into everything that you do. The humility to say, not today. Right. Now, obviously, at M0A, you're able to provide all the sorts of different education, but ultimately, you're not the one inside the cockpit with them. What information do you provide to help people work with their instructor, pick an instructor, and kind of have yeah. to guide them through that side of things? Yeah, so we're always helping with student instructor pairings. If they come to us uh, without an instructor just yet, that's something we really uh, enjoy doing. Um, and it's us working with the instructor and the instructor running off of our syllabus, if they so wish, um, or teaching how we teach or bringing their own flavor and flair to things as well. Uh, really goes a long way. You know, m is meant to complement which you're already doing in the airplane with your instructor. We always say the airplane is a terrible classroom, right? It's hot, it's stinky, it's expensive, there's no pause button. Learn everything you can on the ground and then go demonstrate it in the air when you're spending 200 bucks an hour with your instructor. Um, learn steep turns on the ground, chair fly them in your mind, then let's go out and let's actually demonstrate them. That's uh, the best way to do it. Instruments, another great example. Uh, instrument flying is all about talking on the radios and 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 knowing situational awareness as to where I'm at. All that can be learned on the ground. Um, and then we go demonstrate that out in the air. You know how tough it is to figure out how to enter a holding pattern entry. Imagine trying to do it going through the sky at 90 knots. Let's learn how to do it right on the ground and then let's go figure it out in the air. So it's that kind of valuable information that we're able to instill um, and then translate that over as we hand them off to go fly with their actual instructor literally anywhere in the world. Excellent. Well, um, we are, even though we're at, in September and not yet at the end of the month, uh, I know you, I want to make sure everybody knows that January, uh, you've got your big challenge that, that comes up. Tell me a little bit about, about that uh, before we run out of yes, time. So, yeah, so every January, I'm sure many people have done it, uh, year after year, we do our 31-day Safer Pilot Challenge. It's over on the M0A uh, YouTube and Facebook pages. Uh, each day in January, I post one video, try to keep it short, they're not always short, but eight to 10 minutes, um, all geared towards that idea of making you a safer, smarter pilot. They, they are episodic. You need to watch them all kind of consecutively. Uh, from there, everyone loves to check in, and at the end of uh, the last day, we do a big live stream all together. 
Uh, it's our biggest series that we do every single year, 31 day Safer Pilot Challenge. You can go back and watch 2023s. I can tell you we're already filming for 2024 to get a head start on that. So we're really uh, just looking forward uh, to that. And just It's that mission of just what can we do today to make safer, smarter pilots? And that's what it really comes down to. Absolutely. Well, Jason, thank you so, so much for taking time to join us here on Social Flight Live this evening. Uh, for everyone out there, go check out M0A if you're not already a member or already someone who, who uses those videos. They're, they're truly wonderful, and uh, I'm grateful for everything that you do for general aviation. Uh, thank you as well, Jeff. Thank you so much for everything you do and the Social Flight team as well. Absolutely. Have a wonderful evening, Jason. Thanks, Jeff. We'll see ya. Take care. And to all of you, thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to join us here on Social Flight Live. We will be back next Tuesday, September 26th at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern time as always with Army Black Hawk helicopter pilots, Chris Reeves and Cole Hamilton. They do the air show demos at Air Venture. They do so many other things uh, with the Army National Guard. And uh, it's, it's really something to watch them. Uh, cannot wait to have them tell us everything that goes into flying those helicopters in service as well as in the air shows that we watch. Then on Tuesday, October 3rd at 8 p.m., A-10 Thunderbolt pilot K.C. Campbell will be here. She is the pilot whose aircraft was uh, shot uh, over uh, Iraq and um, uh, miraculously managed to make it back with a severely damaged A-10 aircraft. Um, and uh, that it's truly an amazing story, and she has so much more to offer even than that. It's going to be a wonderful show, so be sure to be here for that. And then on Tuesday, October 10th, Bert Rutan will be here, and we'll be talking about his life experience and those amazing aircraft that have transformed general aviation. Again, to all of you, thank you so much for joining us. And I wish you all blue skies.